Boys and girls, your attention, please. First of all, I'd like to make a little statement. Welcome to the Social Exchange Podcast. All of your friends are welcome. Once you learn the basic rules, it isn't really so complicated, is it? make good first impressions. It's a simple enough matter to give people you meet plenty of room to pass. Try to understand another person's viewpoint. That's a rather simplified suggestion of a mental problem. But you get the idea. Welcome, everybody, to the Social Exchange Podcast. Today I'm here with Aaron Ferguson. Aaron is a harm reduction practitioner, and I've also cajoled him into producing the audio for this podcast from now into the indefinite future. So all of the music and effects that you hear today are his creation. Um, anything that sounds good, you could basically thank him for, and anything that is a subpar, you can just chalk it up to that he hasn't gotten to it yet. So anyway, thank him for the sound, which enhances the show. Aaron, thanks for being with me. Thank you, Zach. It's my pleasure. Um... Audio production is kind of a hobby for me uh, over the last several years, and it's just been it's been really just enjoyable to uh, to take on the podcast here. The content needs to be provided to people, and so I feel good about participating in that. There's so much I want to talk to you about. Thank you, by the way. There's so much I want to talk about about why you think that this is content that is important for people. Um, I encourage people, by the way, to listen to the show Secular Sexuality. Is that what Daryl Ray's show is called? Um, yes, a uh, secular sexuality podcast. Daryl Ray is the author of The God Virus. Um, anyway, Aaron's on that show on episode 86 and then back for a follow-up on episode 88. And I recommend that people give that a listen if they want to get in some details about Aaron and why, um, why I'm having him on the show today and also hear things that we may not cover today. So, Aaron, I have an idea about where the interview is going to go. And before I get to that, Will you tell folks just a bit about what you do and a very brief explanation of what makes you interested in the topic of addiction and harm reduction? So my ideas have evolved greatly over the years. Um, I haven't had a drug or alcohol problem for over a decade, but I did have quite a significant one and sort of came through the traditional route um, into, the, if you want to call it the recovery community or movement or whatever, and changed my mind about a significant number of things as a result of a combination of personal experience, self-examination, and research. And um, so now I'm engaged in providing harm reduction approach to um, you know, either managing, reducing, or quitting of substance use, whichever the person prefers. Um, I'm committed to supporting autonomy with the clients that I work with, allowing them to set their goals uh, rather than to set the goal for them. I do believe that that is the most conducive to success and realizing happiness in one's life. So, um, and, you know, that has itself morphed into me providing alternatives to the traditional abstinence only and the predominantly 12 step approaches. Um, that has led me into seeking what is available in that respect, as well as trying to develop my own ideas about what I would like to do. Yeah, so just as an elevator, that's kind of where I'm at. You're kind of the whole package because you have had an addiction in the past and you've moved on to trying to figure out the best evidence-based and just practical, common sense-based ways of helping people who have those addictions Here's what I'd like to do. There's a lot about your childhood and upbringing that's sort of remarkable. And, and the way you interacted with the world to some extent, you might say led you to, or I guess um, was conducive to IV drug use. You might say you had an addiction. And then not too far after that, you became a counselor with people for addictions. So it is that addiction piece I'd like to cover today. Insofar as addiction is a process that reaches across multiple domains 
maybe could you give me a summary of what your childhood and upbringing were like and take us from childhood to the point where you began using drugs in a way that was destructive? Yeah, so I had um, quite a disrupted childhood. Um, you know, I would say it was just uh, highly unpredictable, primarily. Um, you know, there, was a, there were traumatic experiences there. Um, I'm lucky enough to be somewhat resilient, and I don't really know what causes that. I don't think that we really know exactly what causes some kids to be more resilient than others. But I was born in Malta. And, and several of my other siblings were born in different countries as my parents were sort of traveling like gypsies around Europe. Um, I come from a family of 12. I have 11 siblings. Um, we were all sort of the first half of us were born in different places as my parents traversed the globe and either singing on the streets for money throughout Europe or singing in churches when they came back to the United States, performing in churches. My parents met each other in the Children of God, um, which is a religious cult. And just to be clear, I use the term cult as basically a placeholder for religion. I don't think that there's a clear distinction between the two other than the size of membership or scope of membership. So, you know, essentially if, 95% of Americans were in the children of God. It wouldn't be a cult. It would be a religion. Mm, mm. Um, so I, I do think that that's a word that's generally used by the more dominant religions to subordinate the smaller ones. But I'll just use it since people know what it sort of means at this point. But, you know, according to my parents, it's the, the children of God is much different than it used to be. Um, I have no they're way still of members sort of, of the children of God? No, they, they left um, the claim that they were excommunicated. Mm. Um, you know, sort of all I have to go on is what I've been told about the situation. But, you know, without going too far into the details, they had a falling out with the leadership and found themselves sort of starting their own group. And um, that resulted in me sort of growing up with all of these different caretakers and different, um, you know, neophytes and different um, different people. And then there's the nature of growing up in a big family and, and basically having to raise your siblings uh, when you have the family of the size that we did. So there was a lot of really intense religiosity, sort of even beyond fundamentalism. There's a lot of uh, really just uh, extreme fear that the end of times was going to come sometime soon and that we needed to be prepared for that. Mm. Um Everything we did had to be framed in a sense of urgency that the world was going to end. And that culminated in quite a bit of mistreatment uh, from my parents. And looking back, I can see that it was the result of a lot of fear that was instilled in them from the indoctrination and brainwashing. Um, and I do feel lucky to be where I'm at because quite a few kids that were in that cult either experienced far more trauma than I have or did not survive uh, trying to exit, uh, found themselves on the streets like I did. And, um, you know, at any given time, the things that happened to them could have happened to me and I wouldn't be here. Um, so, I'm, uh, you know, I don't have to know uh, exactly why everything happens. I don't believe that everything happens for a reason, but I, I don't think I need to know all of that in order to be grateful for having found the path that I did. But I did spend a period of several years living on the streets of California as a kid. My siblings and I sort of all stood up and rebelled against the hegemony of this oppressive religiosity that was being foisted onto us, force-fed to us. And we rebelled against that um, in our teenage years, sort of around the time that most kids rebel. Um, our rebellion was a little more extreme, maybe, than the average teenager. And caused us all to sort of part ways, go off on our own. And for me, I had already been sent to live in California several times um, to live with friends of my parents. You know, as I mentioned before, I was farmed out quite a bit. Um, you know, I was taught to read by someone that wasn't my parents. I was potty trained by someone that wasn't my parents. I was disciplined by people that weren't my parents. And um, so I'd already been sent to live in California several times and had been abused by the people that I was sent to live with. 
and decided, you know, I've had enough. I'm 15 years old now and I'm going to go live on my own. Mm. Um, and started sleeping at the high school that I was going to in San Jose, California. Um, I'd been lucky enough to learn Spanish as my parents were living in Mexico and Central America. And they had sent me to live with uh, another friend of theirs from the group that lived in Central America as a missionary. And so I spoke to the janitors in Spanish and they let me sleep at the school. Um, and so sort of my experience in high school was an amalgamation of just sleeping in the back of people's vehicles and couch surfing um, and squatting um, throughout that period until I had basically dropped out of high school. I didn't see any point in going at all. was more interested at that age in just uh, sort of getting high. And so I went from there to Santa Cruz, California, where... I spent some time living on the streets and um, wound up getting arrested. Um, first time I got arrested, I used my actual name. And so they figured out who I was and that my parents were elsewhere. Oh. I had legal legal guardians that they sent me to live with. You were under my 18 at, the, at that time when you first got arrested? Yeah, I was a minor and I got see. arrested for some marijuana. And um, so they shipped me actually back to the legal guardians that my parents had given permission to take care of me. Mm. And um, then I left again and I got into more legal trouble and that culminated in me being sent back to Texas to live with my parents. And then my parents shipped me to stay with somebody else um, in Texas and met a girl that was a friend of my sister's and decided that I didn't want to be there. And her and I hopped on a Greyhound bus and I went back to Santa Cruz and wound up living on the streets there for few years until I was almost 18 years old. So around from the time I was 15 and a half until I was 17 and a half, um, or maybe even closer to 18, uh, I lived on the streets in, in Santa Cruz and, um, you know, she went with, went there with her and she left me shortly after we got there for some other guy that she met. So there I was, um, you know, 2,500 miles away from my family and, Definitely didn't want to go back to live with my parents and didn't have anybody to take care of me. So I just, uh, I gathered a street family, gathered a group of people um, around me and we just, uh, we clung to each other. We, um, you know, we took, we stole from each other and mistreated each other a lot. But at the same time, we were, we would have given our lives for each other. And I owe many of them my life, even though. Some of them are no longer around. Um, and that's when I started getting into heroin. Um, but really, it started with a lot of other drugs, you know, just uh, smoking meth in a light bulb in the back of the drop-in center. Um, you know, they had some places where the, um, the street kids could hang out during the day. And even we would camp out in the parking lot in the back of the place. And the police would come and tell us to leave and we'd come back. And it was sort of just... Um, accepted that that's where we hung out. There were so many of us that had nowhere to go. Um, so I developed relationships with a lot of these people and they're, you know, sort of considered my street family. And then right around, so, you know, looking back on this, it's interesting because around this time, Santa Cruz was actually on the forefront of a lot of harm reduction that was taking place in the country. They were one of the first cities in California to have a needle exchange. Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually remember seeing people that were doing the needle exchange getting arrested by the police uh, for doing the needle exchange. You know, they would come out and set up somewhere near a squat that we were staying at or under a bridge or something. And this was when needle exchange was really unheard of. It wasn't an established notion um, like it's headed toward today. And so that... Uh, Having that was huge because I'd probably have HIV without that. Uh, I did contract hepatitis C at some point along the way. Um, but that's when I started coming into contact with intravenous drugs. Methamphetamine was just readily available and heroin was pretty readily available. Started using those pretty regularly. Didn't know anything about uh, chemical dependency or addiction or anything. You know, it's 16 years old. It's just none of those things are... You have ideas that, that have been planted in your head through the media about heroin or, or meth, um, but nothing really very accurate. You know, we're talking about 1980s 
this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, right. <laughs> sort of stuff that I grew up with. Um, and so I sort of learned through the grapevine about things like cotton fever, you know, getting a, a strand of cotton in your vein and getting sick from that or, uh, you know, getting abscesses or, uh, you know, sharing needles and contracting things from that or staph infections. And, you know, these are all sort of things that I just learned from other users. Um, I didn't have a class on them or anything like that. Um, and, you, you know, what the, the dependency during that period, chemical dependency really wasn't much of an issue. I remember going to jail multiple times. Um, and by the way, I would I would make up a name. You know, I'd get arrested shoplifting or doing something to try and get my fix. Um, you know, and then going to jail, an adult jail, I'd tell them I was 18 years old and then I was born in Europe, which I actually was. I'd tell them I don't have a social security number and they'd lock me away in with the adults. And um, I liked that because I could get out and they wouldn't send me back to my parents or any legal guardians and I could just get out and felt like a man and an adult and go back to doing what I was doing. Um, you know, but um, the withdrawal, the chemical withdrawal really wasn't a big deal during that time. I don't know if it's because I was so young or because I didn't have this set of beliefs that sort of gets instilled in a person when they're exposed to the recovery community for a sufficient amount of time to where they'll interpret withdrawal as this awful, horrible thing. That's um, interesting, man. So do, how long would you use at a time? I mean, what, what was your streak or number of days or using that you would then go to jail and not feel withdrawal effects? Uh, there were months at a time Wow, that I would, that I would go. And I, I mean, I was no doubt I was chemically dependent. You know, I would go through withdrawal in jail without any, um, you know, medication assisted options or any type of drugs to ease withdrawal. And, you know, I had friends on the street that went through the same thing and they would just get sick and then sort of go back, get out and go back to doing what they're doing. Um, it wasn't sort of this whole thing of, you know, this is this disease that's hijacked my brain and here I am completely out of control. It was just, hey, this is what I want to do. And yeah, you're going to be sick when you stop. And so I went through that. I went, I think I was arrested about six or seven times under like four different names that I used during that time when I was on the street. And um, I had some friends that, you know, started to get into some pretty sort of moving up the chain, I guess, of the whole drug market there. I started dating a woman who was um, the wife of a person who was supplying most of Santa Cruz with methamphetamines. She wound up leaving him and living with me instead, and she had connections all the way up through, you know, Hell's Angels and different people that were involved with trafficking drugs up the coast of California. Um, and there was a period of time where it's interesting when you looking back, I think anyone has this experience of looking back on their life where there are waypoints where a person chose one direction or the other. Mm -hmm. And, um, and based on that decision, their life was altered. So I had an experience like that. I had a guy come to me. I was living in a van with, you know, this girl I was dating and he came to me and he was somebody that would come and go in the scene there. And he was like, you know, I was dope sick. He came to me and said, hey, there's this guy we can go rob. Um, I know he's got a bunch of money in his house. And furthermore, he's somebody who molested me when I was a kid. And I used to clean his house for some extra money on the side, and he molested me. And uh, I think we should just go rob him. And at that point, I was dope sick. I had done you know, quite, quite a few petty thefts. And really sort of my ethical um, compass was a little bit off. Um, I guess just from growing up and uh, considering a lot of these crimes to just be something you did when you were a kid on the street, I saw myself as fundamentally different. Right. Um, I was in a subculture that I identified with who was committing the same type of crimes. So I didn't really have this sort of guilty conscience about doing a lot of that stuff um, that I would have had otherwise. So I said, sure, I'll go with you. And the girl I was dating at the time forbade me to go with him. Um, you know, the one whose husband was selling a lot of meth. And she said, I'll sell my bike. She had this candy apple blue cruiser bike that was really nice. And so she sold that to get me some, you know, to give me my fix. Well, 
that guy wound up talking her and several of my other friends into going with him. And by that time, I had left the state. Um, I started seeing that the police were starting to crack down on our whole group of friends. I picked up a charge and sat in jail in San Jose for a couple months, and that was under a made-up name. I got out and went back to Santa Cruz, and I was bailed out by uh, some drug dealers who wanted me to work for them. And so police started cracking down. This was, I think, towards the late 1990s. How old were you at that point? And I was like 17. Hmm. Uh, So the police really started cracking down and arresting a lot of people. Uh, you know, homeless people just, they were just basically rounding people up. And there were a series of political maneuvers that were taking place during that period of time. Looking back, you know, it's interesting to see looking at sociology and looking at history that, that I've studied since then. But there was a lot of tough on crime rhetoric that was going on around that time. And so they just were arresting people left and right, sort of trying to clean up the streets And um, so I said, well, I'm going to get the hell out of here. So me and this girl I was dating hopped on a Greyhound bus and went to Texas. And um, she wound up leaving. I stayed in Texas, moved back in with my parents. She wound up leaving. So anyway, to bring the story back to what I was talking about, she went with him and several of my other friends went with him. And I'm not exactly privy to the details of what happened but it culminated in a nationwide manhunt for them. They were on America's Most Wanted. Wow. Uh, They fled from the police. A murder was committed of this man who apparently owned a hospital in Santa Cruz, um, was considered a pillar of the community. And two of them fled all the way to Florida, where, where they were tracked down, had a shootout with the police, and were arrested. And the other two were busted someplace in California. So... Went down to Texas and decided, hey, I'm going to try and straighten up and fly right. First, I had to get some legal things taken care of. So I wound up flying back to San Jose and doing two months under an alias that I had made up in a jail farm in San Jose. And got out from there and decided to join the military. Um, So that opens another chapter. And, you know, I won't go too in-depth for time constraints because I do want to talk about, you know, sort of the things that that I'm doing now. But... Joined up with the military, and that saved me a lot of hassle in life. I learned how to brush my teeth in the morning, learned how to you know, wake up at a certain time, learned how to follow instructions, and just do the basic things that most people do at their job. And at the same time, a lot of the people that I had been running with were going to prison or dying. So I was really sort of lucky to fall into that note of life. Some of it was the decisions that I made, and some of it was um, other things, you know, just happenstance or the people in my life, my siblings taking care of me and looking out for me or, you know, complete strangers looking out for me. But um, I had met a guy when I was in Santa Cruz that was an ex-Navy SEAL, decided that I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. So I joined the Navy and signed up for SEAL training. I said, you know, um, well, I mean, how much worse can it be than living on the street? Um. And so I started training and running and getting ready for that. I got a few credits at community college and joined the Navy, wound up going to SEAL training, made it about halfway through SEAL training, and they kicked me out. You know, I kind of had a bad week. And they told me, come back. The average person will go through two or three times. So I was like, okay. It was devastating. I wanted to make it through. I had made it through hell week and everything, but I said, all right, well, I'm determined to do this. I want to be a Navy SEAL. So they sent me to work on a ship. Um, I was an aviation ordnance man. I built bombs. We went to the Persian Gulf twice. And I was on the USS Constellation. You have to put in a certain amount of time when you're given duty before you can go to another command. Um, so I was coming towards the end of my time doing that job as an aviation ordnance man on an aircraft carrier when I had gone through the proper channels to get approved to go back to SEAL training. And I'd been training through that whole period of time and knew what to expect. And looking back, I think it was likely that I would have graduated. So during that period of time, I went and donated some plasma, found out that I have hepatitis C. And that barred me from being able to go back and do all of that stuff. And that was another waypoint in my life. 
there were people that went through training around and before and after me that wound up, um, one guy wound up being the only survivor in his whole platoon. Um, and there's a book and movie about him. His name is Marcus Luttrell and lone survivor is the book. Um, he was in the class right before me. So there were people around me that wound up going to the Gulf, that being their job. Some of them died. I wound up getting kicked out thinking it was the worst thing that ever could have happened to me. And it's possible that it saved my life. I have no idea. Um, it sucked that I got hepatitis C, but at the same time, it could have been a lot different. I wouldn't have a family life. I wouldn't have a lot of things that I have now. So I said, you know what? This is why I joined the Navy. I'm going to go ahead and get out. And this is right around when 9-11 happened. So 9-11 happened, and I said, I'm done. I'm getting out. I um, went and did a bunch of drugs and went AWOL, and I was even towards the end of my enlistment. Um, it was just a stupid thing to do. I said, you know what? I'm done with this. If I can't be a Navy SEAL, I don't want to be in the Navy. I had started using heroin periodically during that time. I was stationed in San Diego, and I would drive down to Mexico and bring it back with me. Um, you know, I was selling ecstasy to people that I worked for in the Navy and basically just going back to a lot of the behaviors that I had been in as a teenager. And this was into my 20s. Um, and so to make a long story short, I got out of the military and moved to Europe lived in Europe for a while with a girl that I'd met in Hong Kong, came back to the United States for another girl that I was dating, wound up living in San Francisco. And, you know, there's no shortage of drugs there. Um, just one thing led to another, dating from one girl to another, couch surfing, got back on the heroin. Um, and that was, that was a period of time where I think I had absorbed even more ideas about addiction and about drugs in general that really just exacerbated my whole experience of that, the way I framed it. And I wound up um, to a point where I was spending 100 to 150 bucks a day on heroin and um, just blowing my arms out. I mean, I'm covered in scars from head to toe from abscesses. I really, I mean, you can't see a vein on my arms or legs from that period of time in my life. Um, and lost my job, wound up being homeless again. Um, and, you know, sort of, uh, banking on the kindness of strangers, lived at a homeless shelter in San Francisco for a while and said, you know what, I'm, I need to get out of here. I spent several trips to live with my sister. Um, my oldest sister was really helpful to me and helped me to kick heroin several times. Um, and during this time, um, I was sort of coming into contact with the recovery community in California and the 12 step community there. Um, I picked up a charge for possession or I think it maybe it was a theft charge or something during that time, and was ordered to go to AA. Started going to some AA meetings or NA meetings there, and um, and then left and was sort of bouncing between Houston and California. I would go and get clean at my sister's place and have this really tough withdrawal process, and then go back to California and start using again. And so that all culminated in me picking up a charge in Texas, which, you know, Texas is a lot more strict when it comes to drug possession. I said, you know what? I had heard people talk about asking for treatment through the court system. And well, I'm, I should just ask for treatment, you know, so at least I don't have to go sit in, in state jail, which is basically like being in prison in Texas. So I went and told my probation officer, Hey, I want to get into treatment. She said, okay, well, we'll see what we can do. Wound up sitting in County jail for seven weeks uh, waiting for a bed. And then they put me in a therapeutic community, lockdown, you know, inpatient, state-run rehab. And I spent six months there. It was one of these uh, situations where the entire treatment process was run by the clients. They called us. Really, we were inmates. Um, you know, the policing was done by us, the, uh, the, the leadership, the you name it, every, you know, we had people in charge of every single aspect. We had to confront each other on our behavior, and it was a very confrontational, very in-your-face, sort of try and scare you straight type of experience. And I had been in jail, so it wasn't incredibly traumatic to me. But at the same time, I was done by that point. I, I had decided um, I just didn't want to mess with drugs anymore. And it had wound me up sleeping on a girl's 
broken futon and I just wasn't getting anywhere. For the first time in my life, I'd actually stole money from my sister and I felt really bad about that. So I just said, you know what, I'm done. And I went through this program and I think the success rate there, there was, there was a hundred guys in the sort of iteration that I went through this treatment with and maybe one or two other guys uh, stayed sober after leaving there. So that gives you an idea of what the success rate was of that whole thing. With the um, metric people, being the metric for success with sobriety. Yeah, I guess, you know, if, if, if abstinence was the metric, mm -hmm. um, maybe one or two other people, if I was being optimistic, who went through that, um, even being on probation when they got out, <laughs> right? right? So that's how, you know having to report to a probation officer and still didn't stay sober. And me, I was just done. And at that point, looking back, it wouldn't have mattered what type of treatment I was getting. Um, I just stuck to myself. I didn't really engage in the treatment process. I just kind of did a lot of meditation. I started sitting and doing mindfulness practice and practicing yoga and really went deep into my own mind and myself, didn't speak much and came out of that saying, you know, well, here's a set of goals and things that I want to accomplish. And um, was on probation for two years um, in, in Houston, Texas, driving across town to make it to my appointments and quite a few hoops that um, you have to jump through being on probation. It's sort of a setup for failure if you're not willing to do whatever it takes. And, you know, I received help from a lot of loved ones, received help from friends and made it through that process. During that time, I met my current wife, who was at U of H, um, graduated while we were together uh, there in Houston with a degree in mechanical engineering, um, moved with her to the Midwest for a job that she was offered. And from that point on, um, you know, I, I had been going to 12-step meetings because that's what I knew coming out of treatment. And I thought, you know, this is, this is the path, 90 meetings in 90 days and don't use in between. And I was re repeating repeating sort of all the things that I had heard in the meetings that I had been to and the people that really the only people I had come in contact with who were open about having used drugs in the past were the ones who claimed to be in recovery. And so I said, well, if I'm going to do this, you know, this is the way to do it. So, um, I, you know, I read books that were trying to reconcile like Buddhism and mindfulness with the 12 step approach. A lot of sort of, uh, reinterpreting and triangulating what was being said to mean something else that was more amenable to their experience. And that's what I was trying to do. I would sit there and try and, you know, I, I didn't believe in God. I didn't have any religiosity uh, running on my wet wear, but at the same time I was trying to sort of reconcile and take it or leave it type of thing. And then we moved to Ohio and I went to some meetings there and I don't, I mean, I don't know if you know, but that's a birthplace of AA and yeah. it's, you know, sort yeah. of like really uh, dogmatic, experience there in terms of the 12-step community. And my wife and I tried going to some agnostic or atheist meetings and because you know, we thought that maybe there'd be a lot less of that dogmatism. And um, it was really just, it, it panned out to be, you know, a bunch of guys trying to find women. Um, and you know, I'd be there with my wife. You know? <laughs> it's like, so it, her and I started discussing this experience as we were going to meetings together. And we started to uh, really kind of delve into this and we, we drew on each other's uh, experience and each other's strength to maintain uh, sobriety because she had had an alcohol problem when we met and she quit the night that we, uh, the night that we met. And so that sort of countervails this notion. You can't date anybody early in recovery. I mean, I've been married to my wife for almost a decade now and, you know, <laughs> she quit when we met. Now, now we drink in moderation. Um, Needless to say, I, I found out that a lot of the things that I had been told about addiction, about drugs, and about recovery were not correct. Uh, they were cultural myths. They were things that didn't map onto the lived experience of people. Um, you know, there were a lot of things were the result of either political posturing that resulted in uh, the drug war or uh, religious ideologies that had seeped into the um, you know, the, the, the approach to dealing with addiction and drugs. And I started to find my way out of all of this when I stopped going to meetings, just sort of as, as a matter of happenstance and just not really finding any that I felt at home with, not finding anybody in the recovery community that I felt um, had something to offer me at that point 
in my life. And I started reading books by people like Stanton Peel, um, you know, Carl Hart, um, Heyman. So a lot of the guests that you've had on the show, um, I started reading their books and realizing that there was this whole other world out there of people who were not part of the mainstream recovery movement who were looking at the scientific evidence and who were sort of presenting a different viewpoint than, than was being given um, to most people in America and that had been given to me growing up. And I changed my mind about a lot of the things. Um, you know, I, I once believed that addiction was a disease and that was the only way to explain um, why I did a lot of the things I did and have since come to change my mind about that. Um, I've become much more scientifically minded um, about things like the supernatural, the afterlife, the existence of gods. Um, those are things that I didn't really engage in actively, but I didn't know why. I didn't have a good reason and sort of tried to started to think more scientifically as I started studying about these issues and realizing that um, you know science in itself often is counterintuitive and often runs counter to popular opinion and popular myths. Um, and that is definitely the case when it comes to addiction. I learned a lot from the people, you know, the books that I read and the people that I was studying at that time. My wife and I both just completely stopped all of our involvement with the 12-step groups and came to realize several months later after sort of just living our lives, me going to school, her working, um, that none of the things that they had said were going to happen to us happened. Um, and I think this is similar to the experience of anyone who has left a cult. Um, my parents, I think, experienced the same thing when they left the children of God. They realized that none of the things that they were told were going to happen to them did. And I had to work through a lot of the fear that I had of relapse and a lot of the fear that I had of, you know, if I'm not working this daily program of recovery, um, I'm going to go back to where I was. And um, it was not a good experience for me living on the streets and being in heroin. And I went through a lot of traumatic things. So I had to work through that fear of going through all that stuff again, um, yet realizing that I didn't have to be sort of living in this constant state of worrying about relapse or worrying that drugs were going to have this power over me or worrying that I'm fundamentally defective, um, as is this sort of Calvinistic ideology that's being put forward in the recovery community. Um, so it was a process of personal experience, looking at research that I realized, okay, I don't have to do this. This isn't the only way for me to move forward. And that my drug use doesn't have to define me. Quitting doesn't have to be the apex of my life. Um, there are many things, other things about me that matter, uh, other things that I can pursue, other things that I can identify with. Um, and during this time, my wife and I were chatting and she suggested that I become a counselor. She thought it would be a good idea. And I was going to school for music at the time, thought I was going to be a music performance major. And so it uh, seemed like quite a viable option. And so I switched, switched paths there and took some training, um, you know, in the state of Wisconsin, uh, where we had moved to in Milwaukee, you can take a you know, course and get an in-training license and go out and get a job as a counselor. I mean, the, the restrictions are quite minimal in most states for becoming an addiction counselor. Um, so I, you know, got, got my licensure and went and decided that I, this is what I was going to do and went to work at, um, well, w w would you guess at a 12 step rehab? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would. Almost, was. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's so dominant. You almost, if you want to get in the field, you got to get your foot in there. Yeah. So, um, so there was, the, there, there I was trying to sort of offer, um, court, court coerced clients, this uh, this notion that they didn't necessarily have to subscribe to the beliefs that were being presented to them in order to recover, and that was not well accepted um, by the group of people that I was in. So I wound up being fired from that job, um, you know, predominantly for telling court ordered clients that they didn't have to participate in religion. Um, that resulted in me looking for another job and I wound up getting a job at a methadone clinic, which 
was another experience of changing my mind about quite a few things because I had never been on methadone myself, but I had had a lot of friends who'd been on methadone and there, there was a lot of mythological baggage around it. Um, as is the case, I think in, in a lot of, um, popular opinion about it that isn't really based on research and wasn't really based on, on fact or even lived experience of people that have taken it. So when I went to work at this place, which was the only place I could find to work, I just needed a job. I started to realize, um, that it was a viable option for people to switch over from using more dangerous substances. Um, not necessarily a life sentence and, you know, this is what you need to do now for the rest of your life because you've had an addiction problem. But um, if you want to make a choice to take this medication in moderation and work a job and be able to eat, and not worry about getting arrested or buying something off the street that's adulterated, um, then you can do that. And you know, I would see some people come in the door and actually start gaining weight and get a job and be able to reintegrate with their lives and their families and society in general as a result of just not having to go through the steps of buying an illegal substance, um, the quality control of which is you know, unclear at any given point in time. Um, so that, that sort of experience shifted me towards harm reduction. Um, you know, I, it, it uh, changed my mind about a lot of things, you know, and I, I dealt with a lot of clients when I was there who were being shut out of 12 step groups because they were taking methadone. Um, they were being told that they couldn't share in groups because they were high it really wasn't a place for them, and it was a fulfilling experience for me to be able to provide them with an alternative viewpoint that they didn't necessarily have to do that if they wanted to recover. Um, and I started engaging in smart recovery, becoming familiar with Secular Organization for Sobriety, Life Ring, um, you know, Life Process Program, Dr. Edelstein's three-minute therapy, you know, motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, rational and motive behavioral therapy, um, just, the, the, you know, the things that um, are alternatives <clears throat> from a cognitive approach, the more evidence-based ways of dealing with this. I started seeking them out be, as a result of, hey, how am I going to help these people who are being sort of cut out of the process or being told they're not in recovery because they're on methadone? Um, and so I learned quite a bit from all of that and, and decided I wanted to go back to school. And then I finished my bachelor's degree. Um, and that's where I'm at now about to re-enter the workforce, um, you know, as a counselor. So I know I've, I sort of, you know, that's a long uh, recap up until this point, but I just try to make it as succinct as possible. And that's where we are now. Aaron, I have some questions. <laughs> I have fire, fire away. We see, I could just, Follow the thread of how definitions of addiction, drugs, as you tell your story, I can see where it gets muddy, and I can see where, just several places in there where um, the dominant idea about what drugs and what addiction are, and that they cause something rather than something causing it, or that there are causes at all, just sort of poisons the well for rational thinking. So if you'll excuse me, I just want to go back a little ways and see if I can follow this thread and, and, and bring up some of these things. When you were a kid and you were following your parents around or just engaged in this lifestyle, even then, did you have a sense that that sort of dogma or cult-like um, lifestyle you were engaged in just wasn't correct or that there was something wrong? I mean, eventually you must have if you ran away. So what inspired that kind of thinking that this wasn't quite right? Um, I remember having these lengthy discussions with my sisters um, at that time, you know, the ones that were close in age to me, and talking about how a child should be able to choose what they would like to believe, um, how it should be up to a person to determine what they believe about life and what, you know, what they believe about the big questions in life. And so even at a young age, I realized that um, it wasn't right to be sort of foisting these ideas onto an impressionable mind, even though I was you know, the, the possessor of such an impressionable mind. But um, yeah, so, you know, really, I, I, it's hard to say. I, I think some people maybe are sort of inherently imbued with a more 
questioning nature than others. It, it's, it's interesting to look at my family. You know, there are members of my family who have um, stayed the course with religion um, to this day and, and still believe the things that they were taught. And there are other members of my family who have discarded that and moved past it. Um, you know, and all, all sort of the baggage of the, the uh, brainwashing from the cult. And my parents even have had a, had a time of eschewing that, mm. um, you know, and, and getting rid of some of the things that they were taught, the fear-based ideologies from that group. Um, and so I think it, it, a lot of the bad decisions that I made <laughs> and a lot of the bad things that happened to me as well contributed to sort of <clears throat> just a general reaction to everything and a rebellion against the world that the byproduct of which may have been um, being able to make it out of that. It's almost like breaking yeah. some rib, breaking some ribs during CPR. Yeah, exactly. So you were, you, uh, you had an understanding that there must be something better and that you have some sort of agency to make that happen. But as you say, your alternative was what some people might consider not a lavish lifestyle. I mean, you were, living on the street for some point in time. What was it like to feel like things just couldn't be right with the way that you were living? You had to make them feel better, but perhaps you had very few options to escape that lifestyle. Did that feel trapping to you? Or, um, yeah, describe that experience. Yeah, so I think that uh, a lot of religious ideology is, and, and this is something I've realized as a result of my experience with addiction, but it is characterized by a very black and white thinking, and there's not a lot of gray area. So you're either on the right side or the wrong side, and that's sort of a binary thinking that doesn't capture the actual experience of human beings. Right. You know, there's a source of good and evil in the world, and there's the right path and the wrong path. When in reality, a lot of the decisions that we make are, are informed by things that we're either not aware of or there are so many different variables that it can't be narrowed down to a binary algorithm. So I did have that sort of really, you know, black and white ones and zeros approach to life and everything was just a reaction. Whereas um, when you left, that would have been the right path of that binary thinking, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so when a person is indoctrinated from the time they're a child, to think that things are a certain way and they go through a traumatic or difficult experience in life, it makes perfect sense that they would reach for that and go back to that with, for a sense of comfort. You said that things, yeah. when you encounter the people that you met and finally got settled, so to speak, into what you might call a family of people that you were living with, you said you stole from each other. Your relationships were basically destructive, um, but it was... But in that destruction and in that environment were the kinds of things that you were seeking before. So it's like you had this urgency to escape where you were before, but um, you didn't feel like you had much agency to move beyond what this life was. And so would you say that there were still things that you were seeking? Maybe you didn't have the resources to get it. And, well, now I don't want to put words in your mouth. I think I might be leading a narrative. But would you say then that made drug use attractive to you rather than um, drugs putting you in that situation? No, it was there, there was there was a subculture that I belonged to. It was um, I was willing to do things that most of society was not willing to do. And so were they. And that gave us a sense of camaraderie. You know, it was sort of us against the world. And I talked before about this sort of identity that I had where, you know, this is me, I'm a homeless kid. And then there are all these other people who have their jobs and wake up every day and go to work and contribute to society and participate in society. And I'm just not one of them. That's not who I am. And that really brings clarity to this whole notion of being an addict. Um, that experience is something that I think a lot of people go through with addiction is, is an identity of this is who I am. I'm surrounded by this. I'm fully immersed in it. It, it is almost like a religion. Um, and the only answer to that being sort of another religion, <laughs> you know. Mm. Uh, it's fair to say then when you talked about that kind of, um, at least you look back on it and think of it as turning decision that you made in your life not to go to that person's house, you 
might say that you were, you know, the idea that you had about going ahead and doing it, at that point, you weren't exactly in the business of plotting out your, your long-term best interests. You didn't mind the idea of going to rob this person. And obviously, I know you, and people who can just hear you can tell that you are a person of values and a worthwhile, good person, even if they don't know anything about you. So it does, you know, people do get confused, and rightly so, about why someone like you could be in a situation where you're describing, someone says, hey, let's go rob this guy, and they're, you know, how could someone like you think, oh, that's an okay thing to do? And I'm guessing it's just, you didn't really have a, a sense of being able to sort out values because you were living that lifestyle, that's, that kind of lifestyle defined you, and you, uh, you, you know, you were living for short-term gains. Would you say that's right? Yeah, and... You know, I'll say something that may not be very popular with a lot of Americans, but Perfect. I had been taught that <laughs> I had been taught that the notions of right and wrong were were handed down from supernatural agents and, right. and from a god or from Satan, and I hadn't developed a moral compass outside of that sort of system of reward and punishment. I hadn't developed an ethical system of um, considering the outcome of my actions, thinking from a utilitarian a consequentialist standpoint of what about the person that you're robbing? What about uh, the the store that you're stealing from? Um, I had only developed a sense of right and wrong as a notion of eternal punishment or reward um, or reward in this life from a supernatural agent or, or punishment from a lack of protection from that agent. So it was really sort of a short, uh, small-minded, sort of uh, short-term gratificatory mindset um rather than thinking about the long-term implications and you know you throw that into the pot with the mind of a teenager um you come up with some pretty spurious decisions one might call you somewhat of an expert on cult mentality at least at least in lived experience i hear pretty often that aa itself is a cult and i wonder if you think that's right does aa have cult-like qualities about it and also is there anything about it that you'd say should exempt aa from this label you know, I'll, I'll kind of go back to what I was saying before. I don't draw a clear distinction between cults and religions. Right. So I, I would I would use those terms interchangeably and say that AA is both um, purely for the fact that it possesses all the same characteristics. And, you know, the, many of the courts have already ruled that AA is highly religious, that it's unconstitutional to send people there for that reason. Um, I, I find it sort of disingenuous to claim that it's spiritual, not religious. Not to say that there are people who believe that, that don't genuinely believe that, that aren't just sort of being dishonest about it. Um, but I do find it sort of disingenuous to say that when you, you know, you have God in eight of the 12 steps or something like that, you know, and you pick up the big book and it has God in it more than the Bible. It's, um, it's quite clear <laughs> that that's what it is. And I have no problem if people want to go and join that and they feel like that's the best path for them. But for the for the government to be coercing people or for, for someone to, being, to be told that that's the only way for them um, is really unfortunate. You, um, funny, you were talking about a time in your life where you just thought, you know what, I'm done. And of all the things you talked about being in jail, the possibility of you... Um, going to jail for a longer period of time um, and any other destruction, living on the streets, the fact that, you know, all this stuff, it, it didn't really, there was no Leviathan that pointed you in the direction that you went when you started living positively is what I'm hearing from your story. And what it really sounds like is the things that made you motivated to make a change in a positive direction were things like, well, I guess when you opposed your most core values, there were a lot of detrimental consequences to your drug use in the past, but it doesn't seem like there was there were any mandates or rules that led you to the decision to pursue meaning, happiness, and improve yourself. It seems like, from what you've said in your story now, that the things that motivated you to make a change are things like you stole money from your sister. Things that you that you kind of thought about and said, that's really not that doesn't strike me as who I want to be. That's not my identity. Um, 
I mean, it seems like there's something to that that programs typically can't offer. Do you think that's what you try to take away and, and carry into your work now? Yeah, you know, recently I came in contact with um, an episode that you had that resonated with me. Um, it was the one with Stephen Slate, um, oh, yeah. where he was talking about, or maybe it wasn't, uh, maybe it was his cohort at Baldwin Research, but Mark Sheeran. Mar- Mark Sheeran, that's right, um, was talking about the positive drive principle and how an explanation for why people will engage in things that they realize are detrimental, um, that doesn't, an explanation that doesn't succumb to the sort of uh, spurious notion of a, of a brain disease or, you know, making claims that are unsubstantiated about the brain. And uh, that explanation is that you know, people are driven to seek happiness. They're driven to do the next thing that they think will benefit them. And there may be detriments in the long run. There may even be glaring detriments in the short run. But in the moment when that person's engaging in that behavior, their positive drive is at play in which they believe that that is going to improve their life. Yes, the and, frame is, but the frame is narrowed, right? Is that would that be a way to say it? Sure. the The, the scope is incredibly narrowed. Um, this is what I want to do right now, and right. this is something that everyone does. This is not uh, specific to you know the people that we call addicts. This is a ubiquitous experience for humans in general, um, and I think. For us to adopt that ideology will help us to relax this sort of stigmatization. We don't have to subscribe to unsubstantiated science, these spurious claims that are being made about the brain. We don't have to subscribe to all of that to be more compassionate toward people who are struggling with addiction. We just have to realize the similarities between their experience and ours and that they're seeking the same things that we're seeking. We kind of put a, um, this is where people push against me, and I'm sure you too, when I say addiction is not a disease. Well, you can't just end it there. You, you kind of have to explain yourself. But people hate that because I do know a lot of people who have gone from, well, you know, you're such a piece of garbage and thinking of addiction, people with addictions as special in that sense, in the negative sense. And now there's some sort of specialness to addiction in perhaps you might think, a, I guess, a positive sense or at least not a horrible sense. It's like they've gone from... Uh, a negative 10 on the human rating scale to negative 5, so that's good. So the disease model's great. Um, but it doesn't take into consideration that you're also, you're defining people as somewhat outside of standard human experience. Yeah, that, that would be all well and good if that model had predictive or explanatory power. Right. Which it doesn't, and you know, I'm generally a person to only want to go as far as the evidence warrants. I'm also a person who is naturalist, and I think that things can be explained by science. There's nothing about human experience that sort of is going to elude anything that we could discover um, in the natural world. But at the same time, when it comes to saying, yes, we've figured this out, it's narrowed down to neurons, it's narrowed down to a certain you know, sequence of firing in the brain or one portion of the brain behaving in a certain way. Um, I just don't see the extraordinary evidence where that extraordinary claim is being made. Right. And I also don't see any predictive power to that. Um, I, don't, I don't see anything coming as a result of that model that is useful to people who are struggling with those problems. Um, yeah, I, th- I think a much more useful approach is, is to find out what, what's valuable to a person in their life and help them to pursue that and I think you'll find that with most people, that's not necessarily pathological as we would make it out to be with our with our sort of tribalistic notions about drug users. Yeah, they have. You sort of talked about we have this binary thinking, or I guess false dichotomous thinking, that I think the professional addiction community at large still adheres to, even if they're a a newer, more let's say the term woke for for my political fans here. I would posit that even the harm reduction community um, is plenty rife with mythology and unscientific practice just by virtue of the fact that they're making a perhaps forced effort to reconcile two, you know, two lines of thinking that are dichotomous, but, you know, as you said, it's a false dichotomy. Have you encountered any of this throughout your career and, um, well, especially of recent, and what do you think should be done to remedy that? 
Um, I, I think that a skeptical disposition is a, is probably the best inoculation against that that we can find. Even inside of that, there are going to be all sorts of biases and bugs running on our software yeah. uh, that we'll have to be willing to admit to. But when there is not this sort of notion of um, a heuristic that can encapsulate uh, human human experience, not to say that these things can't be quantified, but to say that they can't be boiled down to a simple shortcut, a mental shortcut, um, which is what we're seeking. Um, certainly in the case of situations that are going to take a lot of thinking from a lot of people that are a lot smarter than me to solve, uh, it simply just can't be boiled down to a trope or a slogan, can't be boiled down to a label. Um, and when they're not, that's okay. It doesn't mean that we're all wrong. Um, it just means that we have to be open to changing our mind in accordance with the evidence that exists. And as is the case with many other topics in our society, we have a fundamental problem with that. We have a fundamental problem with admitting that we don't know things, a fundamental problem with being willing to revise our beliefs. And, you know, while I'm talking about belief revision, I'll say that I think that coming out of an addiction is the ultimate process of belief revision. Mm. It is um, it is revising one's belief in, in much the same way as a person does when exiting a cult or religion. It, just realizing that the noetic or foundational basis for my belief system could be mistaken or uh, needs to be debugged in some way or another that you know the willingness to accept that or the willingness to even explore that as an option um, is not something that is present in our public discourse it's not something that we are conditioned as a society to be comfortable with Um, so I, I think that a skeptical disposition being willing to go over the evidence leads and admit to having been mistaken um, as hard as it is, being willing to reach across the aisle and discourse with people that we may disagree fundamentally about things with, those are probably the best options for dealing with that sort of black and white thinking. When you do counseling with people, do you ever, I mean, you hear their stories and perhaps they're just uh, predisposed to talking a lot about the drug use as being part of their overall life problem, but do you ever do counseling with people where they start out thinking drugs is the issue, but then start to sort things out in a way that drugs are really not at the forefront. You know, just they're shaping up in a lot of different ways, and and then drugs are just kind of not in the conversation anymore. Yeah, I would say that um, the, the, the bulk of the work that I do has to do with helping people to disabuse themselves of the addict identity. Um, and, and not to shape their entire experience in terms of one or two substances when you're being told from every angle that this is who you are and this is you know a life a life of working a program of recovery or a life of jails, institutions, and death are your only two options. People are immersed in that ideology, helping them to let go of that identity, the identity of I am an addict, this is who I am, I'm fundamentally defective, there's something fundamentally wrong with me, which is why I can't get it straight, and I just have to be redeemed, I have to be saved, I have to be transformed by a supernatural agent to, to let go of, of all of that baggage and just realize, you know what, I'm, I'm a fundamentally flawed human being like everyone else, I make mistakes, um, unconditional self-acceptance of that fact. And being willing to move on and realize that there are so many other things that a person can engage in in life that are much more satisfying, much more fulfilling than simply being intoxicated or, or pursuing that as, as the best option. You know, you kindly reached out some time ago and, and let me know that you enjoyed the podcast for a variety of reasons. Um, I'm wondering what draws you to the kind of conversations that you can hear on the podcast and now that you're working with me, maybe you can apply some pressure uh, on the air here. What what are things about the show that you think I should keep doing that are helpful? And maybe if there are any, but what, if anything, do you think I should quit doing or, or do differently? Um, you know, I, I really like the, the general tone of the conversations that have taken place. Um, I think that you've, you've made a good effort of exploring this sort of sphere of information that most people are not exposed to. Mm. I do hope that people who may not be disposed to thinking in that way would be open to at least listening and being willing to examine the evidence that exists 
Um, I think there are a lot of people who th- who believe themselves to be very scientific minded, who have a mistaken view, in my opinion, about what addiction is. And were they exposed to these notions like the series that we just did about the opioid epidemic, as it's called, and this notion of um, prescribing being the source of that, just being willing to examine that there's another side of that, you know, you providing that is an outlier. It makes the podcast an outlier in a sense, just by having that information that can't be gleaned elsewhere. Um, There are a ton of addiction podcasts on iTunes and blog talk radio, and there's no shortage of people who are willing to give advice. Um, But pulling the rope sideways, you know, there's, there's this notion of there's a tug of war going on between two people. And, um, instead of getting on one side or the other, actually just pulling it sideways and and finding a different way to look at this, I think is what we need when it comes to this topic, because there are so many things we've been trying and operating under the assumption of that are totally ineffective, as you probably know better than I do. And so many of the ways that we're trying to approach it are actually either making the problem worse Mm. or they're traumatizing people or they're, you know, creating a climate that's only conducive to more problems. Um, and I think we've only begun to scratch the surface. I, there are certain things that we've discovered that work, you know, keeping people alive <laughs> um, <laughs> definitely helps. Um, you know, the fact that general, in general, most people do recover. Um, they don't have to be coerced or forced into some type of treatment or removed from their environment in order to get better. There are things that we're discovering that work. But even at the same time, um, you know, with the podcast, I think we have to remain open to the fact that there's something we may not have discovered yet that could be incredibly relevant and building on what's, what's been established, you know, as, as shaky as that can feel at times will give us a foundation to go forward with a more informed viewpoint. I'm incredibly reluctant to take this dogmatic confidence that I hear on the part of a lot of people that speak on the topic. Um, just with the realization that I've been wrong before and I've changed my mind so well said. I I was just talking about this the other day um, with some of the people who run Families for Sensible Drug Policy. We did a phone call, and I I have gotten texts or emails or messages um, from family members and friends who are part of my the Social Exchange Facebook group, and they pointed something out to me, which is actually true. Um, they are super conservative. And so politically, they don't feel like they can be part of the conversation. Even though I tried to open it up, there's no way to just for one person to make the environment rich with um, you know, a variety of viewpoints. And they, they had feedback for me that the, perhaps the podcast even, but at least the group in general, has become or is becoming more of an echo chamber than, than I might want, whether I agree with um, diverse ideas or not. That'll be something to pursue in the future, and I think that, uh, well, I know you'll help me with it. You seem like a really open-minded person, so maybe you'll slap some sense into me along the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, one thing I, I have enjoyed, for sure, and especially during, you know, we've had a really polarized political process lately in our country, and we have this sort of uh, intense tribalism that's emerging on different partisan ends. Um it also becomes refreshing to actually hear conversations between people who would generally be considered from different tribes, um, just to speak plainly about it and, and realize that um, there are things to be gained from each other. And um, while we can carry on believing that the other person is mistaken, we can still learn from them. Well, Aaron, before we come to a close, is there anything that you'd like to cover that we haven't touched on so far? I don't believe so. I would uh, definitely encourage anybody to stay tuned to the podcast. Um, you know, not purely for my own edification. I enjoy working on the podcast, but I, I, I think um, you know, speaking objectively from before I became involved with it, there is a trove of content that people would benefit from. Even going into the archives, um, you know, probably. Books could be written on interviews with people that you've already interviewed before if you were to interview them again <laughs> to, to speak in riddles. But, you know, I think that we're going to have some good interviews coming up. Um, we're going to have some good content being put forward. Um, please feel free to make any suggestions. Um, we'll definitely take them into consideration. 
um, it, it's important to get a multi-angle view on these issues. And I think that it's a problem that's bigger than any one of us, and it's going to take a lot of different ideas to tackle. That's a really good yeah. point, and thank you, and thanks for everything that you're doing to enhance the show. Um, just briefly, I should say that I went out of my way, like you said, to look for people who are not engaged in what we might call a dominant or mainstream system of addiction treatment or ideas about addiction or science or politics. I think there does come a point, though, where I give people uh, too much leeway or, you know, I'm not applying enough pressure on people uh, to go back the other way. So people should know that I'm that we are willing to not only willing, but we'd be excited to hear from people who think that they might have an exactly opposite viewpoint uh, that we do. I would be really interested in having that kind of a conversation. It seemed to be fruitful. No, definitely. And um, it is good to be honest about any points of disagreement, but it's also good to acknowledge the points of, of learning that mm -hmm. can be gained from other people. So uh, I, I think the social exchange as a name is <laughs> something that's a breath of fresh air uh, social media isn't always a very social exchange. Um, a, a lot of the venues that we use for communication are, aren't always, um, couldn't be called the most social. Uh, I do think that we, in order to find the answer to an incredibly complex problem is going to require having important conversations, maybe awkward conversations, maybe um, difficult conversations, but important conversations nonetheless. All right, so people can look forward to that. Before we go, I want to remind listeners that the music and the effects that they can hear on the podcast from now moving forward is you, uh, Aaron Ferguson, your original music. Could you give listeners a way to check out that music or anything else that you'd like to plug? Go ahead and do that if you'd like. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, if you want to hear me strangle a cat, you can go to uh, Nomad <laughs> One at SoundCloud. <laughs> but, um, hey, it's just a hobby of mine. You know, it's something I, I really, I encourage people a lot, whether it's an addiction or just an imbalance in life, to seek some sort of cr um, creative, absorbing, creative endeavor. I think it's just good in general. Um, the society we live in places a great deal of emphasis on going out and working hard, and get, getting money and buying things. Um, but there's a state of existence where um, a person can just sort of let all that go if they're doing something they really enjoy. And if you're lucky enough to have found um, a, a mode of living that allows you to do that, um, great, more power to you. Um, but yeah, if you want to uh, listen to some background music while you're washing the dishes or chasing your kids around or having some friends over, hop on over to the SoundCloud. I'll probably be putting some new stuff out there pretty soon when I finish building a studio in my home. But um, yeah, thanks for listening. And thank you. It's been so good to talk with you today. Your story is extremely interesting. I have learned that now even more than the parts of your story I knew before. So you're really articulate and telling it. And I'm really hoping this episode is going to go out widely and people who feel stuck or aren't sure where to turn can find some inspiration in the story that you told. Pleasure to get to work with you, Aaron. Thank you, Zach. It's been really enjoyable talking to you today. And uh, I as well hope that this can reach anybody who can make use of it. And um, definitely keep tuning in. There's a lot more to come. You've been listening to the Social Exchange Podcast. My guest was Aaron Ferguson. Until next time.